Loving the music, very much in hype theme for our conversation today. Uh, thank you to everyone who came. Uh, I know there's a lot going on today, so we really appreciate it, and we're hopefully going to make it really interesting for you. Um, and thank you, too, for being here today, flying all the way to Helsinki to chat. Um, would love if you could give a brief introduction of yourselves, and then also tell us, how did you end up working in Web3 or crypto? Go for it. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Jan Kamenisch. I'm at the Defiti Foundation, one of the main contributors to the Internet uh, Computer Protocol. Web3 or crypto, right? I mean, I guess uh, <laughs> we've both been in, in crypto since like uh, 93, uh, or maybe you're a bit younger still, but like for me, crypto was 93. And actually, it's not really a joke. I, I did my PhD on, on eCash, you know, David Chow, eCash kind of thing, and that's really like a lot of Web3 is about now about cryptocurrencies, so that, that's in some sense. But then, uh, I guess really, like I joined the Defini Foundation in uh, 2018. Uh, and in some sense, you're only in crypto actually if, you, if your protocol is up and running. So from that point of view, I'm in crypto since uh, 2021. George? Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm George Danezis. I'm the co-founder uh, and chief scientist of Mistin Labs. We are the original contributors to the SWE network. Um, like Jan, you know, I'm not entirely new to the field. Um, I've been working on the broad field of decentralization uh, in technology since the 2000s, the early 2000s. At the time, we used to build basically file sharing uh, <laughs> systems, you know, the, these were the days and, you know, we were thinking how you could replace decentralized content distribution networks with, you know, decentralized variants of them, etc. And, and of course, you know, when, when the whole blockchain thing started, it started from largely that community along with the cryptography community. And then when systems like Ethereum that allow you to do computations in a decentralized way started. I immediately got interested. At the time, I was a professor uh, at UCL, still am. And uh, I decided to go to business. And uh, the rest of it is history, I guess. Nice. So you guys have been around for a while, before the hype cycle. <laughs> um, to get us started, I'd love to talk about product market fit. Uh, you can define that however you want. Um, and I'm especially curious because so far, the best use case for Web3 and crypto has been speculation. So how do you guys think about product market fit? What are the indicators that builders and founders should be looking for? You want to go first this time? Sure, yeah. So product market fit is important, right? But in technology, the market very often is a moving target as well, right? So what, what we have seen, let's say, technology being used at one particular time is not the same thing as the next year or five years down the line or 10 years down the line. So, so as a founder, you have to, of course, look at the market and meet the market where it is because that's where you are right now. And you need to be successful at any step of the way. But also you need to look a little bit of what's on the other side of the hill, if you want, right? So to some extent, Web3 already has had a few things that have reached product market fit, like DeFi, decentralized finance. You call it speculation, I call it decentralized finance. Has product market fit in, in various ways. Stable coins, they have product market fit. People do like to hold stable coins in dollars, et cetera, right? For various reasons. Um, culture. Like people call them meme coins or NFTs or whatever culture around, uh, you know, Web3 has some, some market fit, like people actually identifying with particular things and, and being willing to, you know, spend money to, to acquire tokens or, or NFTs associated with particular cultures that give them access to communities. That, that has product market fit. But of course, we're not in the business just for those markets, right? I mean. Our aim, at least with, within Mistin Labs and the SWE network is, is, is one of the, the, the things we build for that reason, is to act as a coordination layer eventually for the whole economy, right? We believe that the whole economy requires coordination. 
This coordination right now is done by centralized parties, but that is very restrictive and they capture a lot of the value. And it would be better, the world would be a better place if most economic activity could actually be done on decentralized platforms so that the value is distributed around. That's the market we would like to have. That's not where we are at though, right? That's not what the market we have. So, so we have to track things, see them grow until we hit that market that we would rather be, be in, right? But we cannot just pretend that the market is different than what it is today. I guess all of that, I mean, if you think about it, what is Web3, right? I mean, it's like some people say Web3 is about ownership, and, but actually it's much more fundamental about, uh, like, uh, more fundamental than that, right? It's about who owns what, who owns your software. And, I mean, you see, you know, like, I guess WhatsApp got sold to Facebook. People weren't happy about that because WhatsApp was really the users. And how can users own a platform, right? Or even uh, I'm as a person, how can I own my, my software? How can I own my data? And I think at the end of the day, that's where, where we want to go. We want to build secure systems where at the end of the day, uh, you as a user can easily own your data, your software. And I mean, if I want to do that, I guess today on protocols like the internet computer, you can actually do that. But you know, if I wanted to do that, uh, say, five years ago, I had to install a NAS at home. There were these peer-to-peer -peer systems where everybody would have to run their own servers. You couldn't do that, right? And then with, with these new uh, platforms, <coughs> we have three platforms, you, you can do that, right? On the internet computer, everybody <coughs> can launch their own software very easily. AI now helps you to, to build that even. And just very important for, like, also for, for cybersecurity because um, the platforms that we have today are not very secure. And with protocols, like Bitcoin has never been hacked, right? So distributed systems really address that. So that point of view, the market here is really, really all of IT. So digging a little deeper, how should builders and founders think about choosing what they're going to work on and build? Especially just to go back to our bigger theme of hive cycles, you know, it's NFT time. Everyone's having and making and buying NFTs or whatever the cycle is that we're in. What should entrepreneurs be thinking about? Should they be building NFTs just because that's the hype cycle right now? I think that people want to have fun, right? I think that's an NFT. Well, maybe a lot of people say NFTs are dead now. It's meme coins and so on. So, I mean, people want to have fun. People want to have mo money, make money. But on the other, other hand, it's really about fun, first users, first adopters. And I guess, again, it depends where you want to go as a, as a business, right? Where you want to... Or you go for the short term, short term money, or really trying to tackle like a big problem th that the world uh, has. And uh, at least the Definity Foundations, of our aim is to go big, right? We want to build a protocol where all of the world's software is going to run eventually. So I think as a founder, you have to have a vision, right? That's like uh, revolutionary, and then just zero in on that vision. And, Yes, I mean, you have to you know, hustle and adopt depending on how things go, but at the end of the day, you have this vision, you want to go there. Yeah, it's a difficult <coughs> question, right? Because to some extent, myself as a founder, I had no choice, right? I mean, <coughs> I had an edge in a particular space in technology that I have developed over 20 years, right? And, you know, honestly, the opportunities that I had we're limited to that, right? I'm not a great businessman. I'm not a great, you know, product guy. I know that kind of technology very well. So this is the only sector I could build a viable business. So I guess the first answer is, at least for me, you have to find where your edge is, right? I mean, you, you have to have some edge over the many competitors you will have. Like, that's the first choice where, where you should actually do business and when you should do business. The, the second thing is, of course, um, you know, the... There has to be some kind of, you have to meet the market somewhere, right? I think that, you know, if I had to choose between a great product and a great market, I would always choose a great market. But at the same time, you know, it's okay to have vision. I think it is important to believe in something more than where products are today or markets are today. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck to today and tomorrow you will have nothing, right? Uh, but you have to basically say, okay, this grand vision of mine, which you need to have as well as the edge, what does it mean today? Right? What does it mean today? Like maybe what is happening today is not my favorite thing. Maybe what is happening today is a very scaled down vision of where I would like to be, 
but this is where we are today, and you have to, to use your edge, use your vision to get the stuff today and get the market today, and then build on that to then move the whole market. Because let's face it, markets don't just move by themselves. Like, I mean, products and people move these markets, and then you move the market to wherever you think it would be a better market for you, but also for, for the world, right? So should founders and entrepreneurs and builders be ignoring the fad of the day? Or should they be sort of balancing you know, their kind of longer term vision and then also you know, acknowledging that right now users are really excited about this type of product or technology? Yeah, just, just to be clear. So when I say you have to meet the market where it is, yeah. if people want digital cats, you have to give them digital cats. Right? That doesn't mean that let's say the platform you're building or the vision you're building or, or the belief you have about the great things that the technology could do in the world has to be limited to digital cats. But if you condescend users who want digital cats today, probably you will not even have ever a chance to go beyond, well, failing basically. So do you have a problem with cats or? <laughs> I, love, I love digital cats. Okay. <laughs> um, let's talk about building blockchains. Um, that's an ambitious undertaking. You also have to gain traction for it to kind of work out. How did you guys decide to do that? Again, I think it's the vision here, right? Where, where you know, like, uh, you, you want to build a secure platform where, where people can build sovereign software. That, that's your goal. And then you think about, OK, how can I do that, right? And what is necessary? I think, you know, I guess blockchain is really a misnomer here totally, right? It's, it's, to me, it's like a uh, secure distributed system that uh, has decentralized control. It, it's all about uh, how, I mean, at the end of the day, it's how, how you can make things secure, right? I mean, how you give distribute control such that there's no single point of failure. Um, but I think, I mean, of course, what, what fascinates I guess, me, both of us, is all, all the technology behind that. You can solve hard problems that have a great use case. And then, yes, you, you need to figure out, like, uh, is, is there a demand for it? Uh, but I guess clearly here, the, the world has now realized that there, there is the demand for these systems. Whereas, you know, tw 20 years ago, you could build that, but, but nobody would really care. Yeah, I think that... Building a blockchain from scratch is a thing of madness, right? It's, it's equivalent to, I don't know, the early 80s when companies were, were starting to build new personal computers or, you know, in the 90s, everybody was trying to build an ISP. And, and you know, you look back and you're like, wow, that, that is a huge undertaking. Like building a whole computer, building a whole network it, is a huge undertaking. And I think that the last five years will be known as the golden age of this kind of like base layer blockchains, right? Because the truth is that anyone who approaches me today and says, look, should I build a blockchain from scratch? My answer is don't, right? Like the amount of collective effort that has gone in the current platforms that we have uh, is tremendous. And for example, the, the reason why at Miston Labs we were able to, to build SWE um, and, and, you know, launch the initial versions of Sui is because we had worked for years before within Facebook, within previous startups, and then we also used the best available technologies for everywhere else to be able to get, like, the best of breed network. Like, doing all of this from scratch at this point, plus all the commercial stuff, if you leave the technology aside, which, by the way, is like rocket science, uh, even the commercial stuff is just a huge undertaking. So I think the... You know, we're reaching the kind of the end of the 80s here, which was the equivalent in personal computing time, where it doesn't really make sense to build a blockchain from scratch anymore. Like at this point, the market is quite full of different options and different applications that would need decentralization, <coughs> secure platforms, etc. Would be much more wise to actually start picking what platform better suits them and then using that rather than spend an enormous amount of time and money to build a platform from scratch. I can see you're trying to keep competition from coming for you. <laughs> I love competition. There is already plenty of competition in this space. I think the, the, the matter is also where do you focus your energy on, right? Where, where, where do you have your edge? And, and you know, if you build something where you, you, you got to compete, you've already lost, right? You, you need to pick your, your core business where you want to zoom in. And then, you know, if that means build on, on an existing uh, platform already, you're at actually an advantage, right? I mean, if you want to build you know, like, like 
take an example, like Chainlink, if somebody w would want to build Chainlink today, they would not build it like Chainlink. They, they would build it on top of one, uh, you know, like Zoe, or I guess better off, of course, on the Internet Computer <laughs> Protocol. But you, you build it up on that because you don't have to worry with all these like other nitty gritty details that you uh, would have to like otherwise, right? And then you can core focus on your core business and be much much faster and be faster faster to the market, right? Mm -hmm. Shifting gears a little bit. How do you guys think about navigating um, making business decisions that maybe benefit you in the short term, but might make your users or your customers a little bit upset? Um, yeah, how do you think about longevity and, but also you're running a business? Product choices, business decisions, policies. Yeah, so, so the Web3 space is very interesting because a little bit like for any emergent technologies, there is the technology, there is the business, and then there is the culture around both the technology and very often the business as well. So community is very important in a decentralized system because to some extent, you know, being the initial contributors to a protocol like SWE, for example, you don't have control of it after it launches like you have to actually bring in lots of actors into the uh, you know into the decision making you have to make decisions collectively to some extent so so that puts a lot of restrictions in what things you can do that are not liked on one side on, on the other side community actually has an upside which is that it comes with a, a general amount of goodwill Right? Like once you actually build a vibrant community and that community has seen good decision making in the past and, and products that, that they like and that they're happy to recommend and create a culture around, actually that community is very generous in, in hearing people who, who, are, who need to make decisions in, in this context and, and giving them the benefit of the doubt. Uh, so so there, are, there is this kind of balance, right? Like you have to care about your community. Your community will give you quite a bit of slack actually. Uh, but you cannot make unpopular decisions for a very long time and still expect that goodwill to continue, right? So, so it's a careful balance. And to some extent, when a decision is unpopular, the, the benefits have to fall and, uh, uh, you know, across everybody, right? You cannot say, well, I'm going to make an unpopular decision that just benefits me and my company, right? You have to make unpopular decisions and then make an argument that, look, the whole protocol, the whole community is going to be better off as a result. Uh, that's a lot of checks and balances, actually, particularly in the Web3 space. I mean, we, 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 I guess there are two answers here, right? On, on one end, you just got to think very, very hard about those choices and just make sure you can go forward and have, like, you know, very know very well you, you want to be and just prepare the path there so that, you know, you, you tell you, look, today it's like this, but if you really want to go there, so expect this to happen, right? So. There, there's that, so you just got to think very hard if you build one of these platforms. And on, on the other hand, like we, we had like on, on the Internet Computer Protocol, certainly a lot, like usage picked up because there was like meme coin mining. It was actually interesting because it's called blockchain on blockchain kind of thing. They did like mining on, on, uh, on ICP. And that led to a lot of like congestion, and then uh, in order to so there was like, a number of solutions to toward that. But one was also it was clear that some uh, some services were just underpriced or too cheap, right? Uh, and and so I guess th then like we had to suggest to to the community to actually let's adjust those prices to be more realistic. And you know, like, so you, you got to raise prices. Nobody likes likes that. But at the end of the day, like, every, everybody loved it because it actually fixed uh, the, the the system, and uh, so that you can still do it like that. But I think you have to think long term and really tell people what the vision is, where you have to go, and then uh, if you explain uh, people, then it can still happen. And if I may add one more thought, following from that, right? If you make an unpopular decision in the context of Web3 at least, you have to be ready for that unpopular decision to become part of your culture because it defines you, right? So to give a concrete example, uh, as part of the launch of C Network, SWE did not have airdrops, which is this, you know, you distribute tokens to early adopters that, that did some small work, let's say, for you. O on the basis that actually this was not really the core community of the protocol that really builds that are the fundamental builders. This was a stunningly unpopular thing, of course, amongst that constituency. 
And for many months, the, the main kind of narrative around SWE on social media, etc., was like no airdrop, no community, etc. However, by now, the fact that there was no airdrop and, and folks on Twitter, for example, would have the no airdrop, no community, has actually become part of the SWE culture. In fact, I was, I was lining up uh, at security in Salt Lake City and someone saw me wearing a, a SWE uh, t-shirt and shouted to me, no, no airdrop, no community, which now actually puts this person within our community. It has become basically part of what defines the culture of SWE. So if you make a, an unpopular decision, you have to be ready for that decision to define you and create boundaries around who's in and who's out. Mm -hmm. And if you're not happy with that, probably you have to think again about the decision. Did you guys ever reconsider internally as a team or were you just committed to that choice? I think things worked out better for not having done an airdrop as we would have done it at the time. If I had to do it all again, probably I would have done alternative things to distribute tokens more widely that are still not an airdrop as I would have done it at the time that probably would have generated less animosity early on. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it is what it is. And also we don't make the decisions for a decentralized protocol, so you know. Right. How do you um, assess sort of what is a, maybe a temporary event in your company or product's lifetime and what is a, an actual shift that you need to adjust to? <laughs> I think it varies very much. Right? I don't think you can have like very generic rule and like at the end of it that, that defines a startup, right? I mean like uh, nothing is the same, like every day is different and, and you really just, you know, like uh, every day you, you tackle different problems and you just, uh, you know, you just got to tackle them in the best way you can. You know, I think you can't make generic rules. I think like really the generic rule is be ready to do any job that just comes your way and, and, and uh, you know, like rethink everything every day. Like that's uh, like typical hustle kind of thing, right? I don't have any great wisdom there. I think that to, to some extent, this is the, the job of, of having some strong leadership, right? Uh, within organizations, right? Because these are subjective calls, right? I mean, you, you can have different executives that believe that something is a fad or something is a fundamental change in, in the market. You, you can have other people you know, who identify different ones, right? It, there are no rules around that. Um, I think that what, what we are looking at sometimes is fundamental shifts in underlying technologies. I mean, our field is, is young enough still not to have seen that. It's not like we've seen the transition between videotapes and you know, video streaming yet. You know, as an outsider to some of these industries, I would think it's pretty obvious, but then maybe it's not, right? When, when such a tremendous shift happens, maybe it is still not obvious to the insiders. Who knows, right? Let me ask you about crypto winters, which is a very fascinating topic to me personally. Um, every time there is a little bit of a downturn in the market in Web3 and crypto, I always hear investors talking about how, no, this is great, because right now is when the best work will be done. All the smartest founders and builders are going to be heads down building things. How do you guys think about those winter periods? What should people be doing during those times? <laughs> I'm not sure whether that's true. I guess people say that, right? That's where the best stuff gets built. But uh, I think sometimes a lot of people just struggle to survive. And do those people that have the best ideas survive? Probably not, right? But maybe the more relentless, uh, resilient people survive. Um, but I think it's just whatever. Sometimes it's maybe seats out or like weeps out some people that, that shouldn't be there, but uh, sometimes it also weeps out the wrong, uh, wrong people. So, um, and you could also see like, a, a, a while ago when certainly like all the funding was going into AI and uh, not into crypto, certainly projects changed. Was it for the, for the better? I, I don't know, right? I, I don't think, I think it's pretty random and like everybody struggles and then everybody struggles and then later on everybody is doing better. And I mean, of course, if there's no winter, it's easier for everybody. Maybe some people that don't have market products fit survive, but I wouldn't agree to that statement at the end. Well, Kia, of course, you know, 
investors would love the winters, right? Because you can get more of the company for less of your investment. So, you know what I mean? Of course, uh, investors have a very specific perspective on, uh, on winters, right? Um, I think to, to me, the winters in, in funding largely, but also in interest, it's not just, the, the winter is not really characterized by there is less funding available. Usually there is less funding available because there has been an event that has driven attention away or has created fear. Um, there are definitely a time where you identify people who are committed to the long term. That's useful. Uh, so to a large extent, it's useful by who, because it, it helps you identify who's not there. And then when the winter ends and things thaw, and there is a fury of activity, probably you can rely on the people who are there in the winter a bit more than the people who just came back when things got, got uh, good again, right? Um, I think that the nature of Web3, but maybe, maybe this is the nature of technology, is a little bit extreme in how, let's call it out, how investors are really very easily wooed by the latest fad here and there. Now, in Web3, we've been beneficiaries of this, so you know, I cannot really uh, speak very negatively about it, but yeah, when I see money swift, uh, shifting within six months from Web3 to AI to quantum, and you're like, come on, we're grown-ups, right? I mean, if you have a thesis, that thesis should hold over a couple of years at least, right? Not just a month. So, but this is the nature of the business. I guess you'll have to have an investor and ask them why, why the winters happen at all is a little bit of a mystery. Mm -hmm. Speaking of funding, um, talk to me about navigating the capital markets in Web3 and crypto. Um, every time there is, you know, the Bitcoin price goes up, all of a sudden everyone's a crypto investor and wants to find the next startup to invest in them, and then price goes down, everybody leaves. So how do you navigate that as an entrepreneur? Should you all stop taking venture money? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think it, it, it depends, right? I mean, there's pros and cons, but um, I guess you, you have to be smart about things like uh, about anywhere else, right? And because uh, and once you have done it a few times, you, you, you learn your lessons, what, what to do and what not to do, right? I mean, you, you hear or just listen what happened to others. But it, it is tough to navigate, right? And uh, many people got, get screw over, screwed over. And um, also, also here, it's like you, you can't you know, get general advice uh, again, when it really varies what you're up to. And it's hard to navigate, of course it is, right? It's, it's not easy to make money, uh, of course it's hard. I think the hardest thing to navigate around that kind of volatility is not so much investment. Investment is also challenging, as much as retail sentiment and community sentiment, right? Uh, it's just that, you know, when someone has bought a token for like, I don't know, $10, and suddenly it becomes 20. It's not a, like I'm talking about these kind of amounts of money. They become positive about trying things around the technology, right? They're like, okay, you know, I, I have 10 free dollars to try things with, right? And they go around and they try things and they are optimistic about this technology. Then when it becomes $5 again, right? Then they become pessimistic about the technology. They stop telling their friends about it. They stop trying new things or being hopeful about it. They stop using it, basically. And I think this is the thing that really impacts the business, right? Because suddenly, your market is just taken out of your, you know, under your feet, right? I think that, that's the damaging thing. The funding stuff, because you're dealing with professionals, because you're dealing with investors, because you're dealing with people who, who actually do have a bit more vision, you can navigate it. But the retail sentiment around the technology that is really linked with people losing a little bit of money here and there and that creating very positive or very negative feelings, right? That's a tough one. That's a much tougher one. And then lastly, I definitely want to ask you guys about what are some things, some unusual things, or maybe against or counter to kind of conventional startup building wisdom that your companies have done that have worked out? Or not. You can give me disaster stories, too. <laughs> OK, but uh, I guess uh, Web3, if you look at it, a lot of like, the Web3 companies are I mean, just playing to the, the sentiment that uh, George was mentioning before, it's a very retail uh, kind of uh, speculation. 
and a, a, a lot of the um, organizations are a lot of marketing and, and uh, very little about technology. And I guess what, what we have done very differently is uh, we've built a lot, we've invested a lot in, in technology, right? Like uh, probably one out of 10 or one out of 20 people are non-technologist. And so I guess in the, in the you know, like we, we suffered a bit from that because then you have great technology but nobody knows about it and we're still suffering a bit from that. So on the one hand, it was good for us because now we actually have this huge technology base that we can build upon, but we have to play catch up on, on the marketing side. Yeah, a little bit similar, but quite different at the same time. One thing that is unusual about Miston Labs is that it has five co-founders, so that already is quite unusual, that we are five co-founders and we still love each other very much and we're still in good terms. Uh, there are lots of horror stories when there is more than one or two usually. Yeah. Uh, and the funny thing is that all five co-founders actually have a technical background. Uh, so this is very unusual. Uh, but unusually for technical co-founders as well, particularly so many, uh, we actually have made it our business to understand all aspects of the business, down to some details. So we, even before founder mode was a thing, we, we were basically into the details of both the technical operations, but also the commercial operations. I see a lot of startups where the co-founders try to play to their strengths and very loosely, uh, uh, you know, kind of rely on others for the stuff that they don't know. I think that, you know, that's quite a... Uh, a dangerous strategy uh, to let things go quite early. Fair enough. Well, on that note, we're out of time. Thank you guys so much for being here today, and thank you guys for being here with us. Thank you. Thank you.